that. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah 49 and 14. And um, Isaiah 49 and 14 through 16. It says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Uh, how many of you ever felt forgotten by God? You don't have to raise your hand too high. I know we're in church and we, we try to pretend like we never think those thoughts. Uh, but I have felt at that, at that point in, in time in my life where maybe, maybe I feel forgotten. Maybe I feel just like my prayers are hitting the roof and, and they're coming right back. They're not, they're not reaching his, his ears. Um, so this is where Israel was. They've been brought out of captivity and now they're in Babylonian captivity. And they're, and they're complaining and they're grumbling about God has forgotten us. But God says, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yeah, they may forget, but I will not forget thee. See, as we love children, as a mother loves a child, that's a very hard thing to forget about. Yes, there are people who have forgotten about their children. Yes, we're not perfect parents. But we get some glimpse of, of love when you're a parent. You get this glimpse of what Christ's love is like. It's a different kind of love when you have a child. And... He compares that for a reason because Christ's love is perfect. Even in the best modeled love we have on this, we can't get a glimpse of God's love for us because it's perfect. It's enduring. And in verse 16, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. I see you always. You're always before me. You're always on my mind. You're always on my heart. You're always there. You're always present with me. I am thankful for a God who not only knows you, not only knows me, but loves us with a, a, a perfect love that endures throughout all time and all eternity. That's the God that we serve. He loves you today. Despite what you may have heard from others or despite how you may feel this morning, you've got a God that loves you unconditionally today. Unconditionally. Thank you for standing. I want to speak to you on a title, Beyond the Stone, today. Beyond the Stone. So this passage described the people of Zion. They had been, in, again, in Babylonian captivity. They felt forgotten. They felt like God had forgotten them. And maybe we think that God has forgotten us at times. In Jeremiah 31 and 20, I love this passage. This is from the message, but it says, O oh, Ephraim is my dear, my dear son, my child in whom I take pleasure. Every time I mention his name, my heart bursts with longing for him. Everything in me cries out for him. Softly and tenderly, I wait for him. Yes, his heart is bursting for you. His heart is beating after you. He is in love with you. We serve a God that is just full of, of love and richness and mercy for you. You are ever present on his mind. He loves you. I'm thankful for a God that knows everything about me and yet continues to love me. He's seen us at our worst. He's seen us on our worst days. And yet he says, I still love you. I'm crazy about you. He's seen us at our worst and he says, I love you. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. The word graven here means to cut into or to engrave. It means to just cut in two. And so it can be compared to Ezekiel 4, which says, Now, son of man, take a brick and place it before you. Draw a picture of the city of Jerusalem on it. It means to be inscribed. God's chosen people are always before him. And by the way, God's chosen people are not just the Old Testament tribes of Israel anymore. Because when the veil was torn, you and I became a part of that. We are a part of God's chosen today. You can be a part of his family today. And so the final capstone of this promise would be the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. We are engraven on the palms of his hands, but he also took nails into the palms of his hands so that you and I could be saved. And so we are reflected in those scars. He died for you. He cannot forget you. But what about when we have a heart of stone? What about when we have pride? Is anybody proud in here? You have a little pride problem? I have a massive pride problem. I have little man syndrome, so I have an ego, and I always have to prove myself to the world. I have a pride issue, okay? 
I wrestle with pride. I struggle with pride. I struggle to say I'm wrong. I, my younger brother and I, we spend most of our Sundays debating about who only, it could be religion, sports, politics. We will have an argument for at least an hour and a half. We drive everybody crazy around us, but we love it. We just love to be right and to argue about silly things that nobody cares about. We will argue and argue and argue because there's some pride involved. There's never going to be a time where one of us looks at the other and says, you're right, you're the smarter brother, and I'm sorry. (laughs) That doesn't happen. That won't happen. We'll go to the death before somebody says, you're right, and I'm wrong, because we have a pride problem. So we're like this with God at times where we have a heart of stone, but we can't get past that, and we become calloused and cold to his will because we got it all figured out. We've, we've got it under control. And there's a lesson that I think is, is important to be learned, and it's something to be learned from the great artist and sculptor Michelangelo. Michelangelo was in his early 20s, and, and I'm in my late 20s, and I'm not near the man that Michelangelo was. So reading about people in the past, I'm like, wow, I've got a lot to do in life before I die. Anyway, side note. But he was in his early 20s, he was commissioned to create a statue representing the biblical hero of David. And we got a little picture of, of David's face here. Um, but th- he was cre- commissioned to create this statue. He was offered a colossal block of marble, which had been previously worked on by two other artists. And both artists had abandoned their work after what? Noticing imperfections in the marble's grain. They were given this marble, they were given this stone, and it wasn't good enough. And so they pass it on to the next one, and, oh, it, it's not good enough. It's not quite right. And then Michelangelo gets a hold of it and says, I, I, I can make something out of this. There's a message to be uh, taught in that, right? You ever been passed up on and passed up on and passed up on, and then Jesus says, you know what? I see the imperfections, and watch the art that I can make out of your imperfections. I, I don't know. I, I, there's a message in that somewhere. But Michelangelo took up the, the challenge of carving this figure. And so one thing that makes this work of art so unique is that the stone had been abandoned by those other artists, but also that he took what was left and made something great out of it. And so he was different than other stone sculptors because Michelangelo worked freehand. He would take a rock that was just blank, and this is definitely not the size of rock he would use, but for our purposes today, we've got this little rock up here. He would take a rock And he would make a sculpture out of it. But the rock, he never had a model in front of him. Other artists would use a clay model. So they would go ahead and use clay to make what they want to carve in the stone. But Michelangelo would just start with a blank slate, no clay model, and start to carve into the stone. That's what made him a great artist. He was talented. He was different than other artists. And the strength and the skill that would be required, not only is this person an intellectual genius... But he's strong because he has to, all day and night, he has to chisel at this rock. And it was much larger than this, right? And so he's chiseling away, and he he has to use strength and stamina to to, to even create this sculpture. The sculpture would be massive. It it would barely fit into this room. And so he began to chisel and chisel and chisel. And all night and all day, he would work on a sculpture for years. And so he created what's considered the greatest sculpture known to man, the Statue of David. But while he was creating that, he would stay up at night. And this was before we had uh, the, the, the beauty of technology and electricity and Alexa and smartphones and all those things. And he would put candles on his hat just to light up the night so he could continue to work. He had this hammer away. And then he would, he, he would not even sometimes uh, you know, just, just sleep in the same clothes and get up in a few hours and go back to work and just uh, you know, probably didn't smell too good. And just kept working all day and all night on this statue. Because he was obsessed with making this statue come to life. But this is not the greatest work of stone ever achieved. Something much greater happens when God takes our stony heart. When God takes our pride. When God takes my ego. And says, you know what, it's going to take some work. I'm going to have to work hard on this one. <laughs> this guy's going to take a little extra muscle. But I'm going to I'm gonna begin to chip away at that heart of stone. And that's a painful process. I don't know if he's ever chipped away at your heart, but whenever he starts to work on our heart of stone and he starts to chip away, it's a painful process. It's not fun. It's not fun when we allow him to do surgery on our heart. When we allow him to change the person we are, it's not fun. It's difficult. 
But if you've ever been through a valley and you come out of the other side, you th you're always thankful that God has made you who he's made you now. You always look back and think, well, the person before me needed that lesson. The person before me needed a dose of hum humility. The person before me needed to learn some things. And so Ezekiel 36 and 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. There's something that happens when God breaks through our natural inclination, which is to sin, to be prideful, to never apologize, to never change, and it's perhaps the greatest redemptive art that's ever been accomplished. Michelangelo's art was amazing because he took what everybody else threw away and said, I can make something, I can redeem this. But it's nothing compared to what God does whenever he takes my stony heart and says, I'm going to make a heart of flesh. I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to make something out of this. It's natural for us to lean towards our sin. I have never met a human soul that loves to be wrong and to apologize to everyone. Not met that person. I've even met very humble people in life, but yet nobody is exempt from stubbornness. We still have stubbornness. We still have pride. And I want to take a moment, too, and make something clear. There are those who are enduring trials in life, and you don't understand why God is allowing you to go through it, and you haven't got your answer yet, but you're still praying and you're still trusting in him. That's different than whenever God is working on us and we're saying, God, stop, stop, stop. I don't want you to mold me anymore. That's where most of us end up, is God, please, you know, take this out, make, make this easier for me. And yet, if he makes it easier, we never really get the blessing that he's trying to, to, to make happen in our life. We want him to take away the pain, but without the pain, there's no miracle. Without the test, there's no testimony. And so we want him to chip away at those things until it hurts too bad, and then we say, all right, God, I've had enough. I've had enough. But he's making a work of art. He's making something great out of you. And we get angry towards God in those moments when God is working on our hearts. And this is where Israel was, and they complained. But God said, wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers as wilderness. Their fish stinketh because there's no water and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth for their covering. Their covering. See, our sin is the only thing that can clothe the heavens with blackness. Our sin is the only thing. Just as much as every time a, a sinner comes home, all of heaven rejoices, I believe that when we live in sin, there is mourning. I believe there is sadness because of our sin. Heaven mourns at my sin. And there's an old hymn that I think has it quite right. It says, what, was it the nails, O Savior, that bound thee to the tree? Nay, t'was thine everlasting love, thy love for me, for me. It's his love for us. It's his love for us that kept him on the tree. It's his love for us that kept him carrying that cross when it was heavy, when he was running out of breath in his lungs. It's his love for us that said, I'm going to keep going forward because it's my love for them. It's my passion for them. I'm not going to give up. It's his love for us that kept him at work shaping and molding and like Michelangelo as long as it takes to make that work of art he's going to continue to chip away and keep going and chasing after you that's his love his his love for us is good his love for us is great but Michelangelo stone had been abandoned by those other two artists and I think we base our understanding sometimes of God's love on our experience with the flawed relationships in our lives Oh, you, God doesn't love me because people are abandoning me. God can't love me because other people told me that I'm not lovable. God can't love me because even the church has let me down and said that because of my past, that they have no place for me. So how can God love me? I'll be very honest with you today. I care a lot about what you think about me. I try my best to 
to, to, to make a good impression on people. I want people to like me. But at the end of the day, if you, if you look at me as, as, as worthless, or it doesn't matter because if God sees me and says I can make something out of that, that's all that matters to me. And that should be the same for all of us in the room. If he sees you for who you can be, that's what matters. Not what everybody else says about you. Not everybody else that's walking around holding your past over your head and saying, hey, look at this. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's him that, that authorizes, that gives authority. It doesn't matter what everybody else says or thinks. As long as he loves me, as long as his grace is good, as long as his grace is sufficient, I don't need anybody else's grace. His grace is sufficient enough for me. But you ask someone why they left the church and why they abandoned their faith, and almost always it will be because I was hurt by somebody else. It will almost always be because the church is full of hypocrites. The church is full of hypocrites. I always say we got room for one more if you want to come join us. The church is full of sinners. Yes, we are. That's why we're here today, because we need him. We're gathering together today because we need him. So if you're imperfect, please come join us. If you're perfect and you've already made it, carry on. But this is a place for people who are broken, who need help, who need strength, who need restoration, who need Jesus in their life. And so almost always it says, you talk to someone, why, why did they leave the church? Because somebody hurt me. Somebody let me down. Somebody disappointed me. Because life change always happens in the context of our relationships. For better or for worse, big life changes happen in the context of our relationships. We base our entire walk with an all-loving, perfect God on experiences in a fallen and depraved world. When we fail to understand that it's our own pride, our own stubbornness that won't allow him to complete the work in us. It's because somebody hurt me that I'm not going to let God heal me. I don't understand that. I don't understand. He's perfect. He didn't hurt you. He didn't hurt you. I know that we have questions about why God allows certain things. I've been there. I Trust me. And it may feel like he's hurting you. It may feel like he's the one who, but I promise you he has been faithful. He has been there through every bit of it. He knows every tear you've ever cried. He knows every nightmare you've ever had. He's been there with you through every experience, every pain. He's been there the whole time. He has not failed you, nor has he forsaken you. I promise you that. We don't always have to know why he has allowed certain things, but I can promise you he hasn't forsaken you. So the difference between God and Michelangelo's artistic endeavor is that God will not force you to let him work on your heart of stone. You can keep your heart of stone if you want to. I've met people who have kept that heart of stone for years and years and years. It's, it's difficult, but we can, keep, we can hold on to that. We don't have to let him start to work on us. He won't force himself on you. Isaiah 50 and 4 says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. See, our problem with pride is a problem of rebellion, and we have to let God open up our ears, and sometimes we have to listen to him and stop talking. And that's not, that's not the easy part. We love to tell God all of our problems, but when's the last time we said, you know what, God, I, I just need to hear from you. I, 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 don't, I don't need to just throw all of, uh, and, and, and trust me, God is always listening, and, he, and he's always there for us to, to complain and to have a, have a moment where we say, God, I'm frustrated. But at the same time, do we ever stop and say, okay, now I need you to speak to me, and I'm going to listen to what you say, even if it's contrary to what I want to hear. I need you to speak to me. So God wants us to put down our arms of rebellion. Not to double down on our decisions, but to throw our hands up and surrender. We were made to be identified with him. We belong to him. We are made in his image. In his image. The theologian Alan Redpath said this, If you've come to the cross for redemption, you must also come to it for identification. If you come to the cross for, for God, I need you to save me, it also must be, I need you to change me. Okay? It can't just be, God, I need you to fix everything, but God, I need you to fix me. I need you to make me. I need you to shape me. I need you to change me. Not all my problems, not my circumstances, but me. Me. I need you to change me. I want to look more like him. I want to be identified with him. And so he's got to chisel away at my pride. 
He has to chisel away at my vanity. He has to chisel away at my bitterness. He has to chisel away at all those broken relationships, all those disappointments. He's got to chisel away at all that pride that I've built up because I have pride in my heart and I've decided that I have a better plan than he's going to chip away at that. He's going to chip away at that. He's going to say, I need you to forgive so and so. I need you to let that go. We got bigger things to move on to now. I need you to let go of some of the hurts of the past. It's going to hurt. It's not going to be easy, but I got to chip away at that so I can make the art. I've got to chip away some of the, the, the useless stuff. I got to get the junk out of the way so I can make you in my image. I can make you look like me. I want you to look like me. And so Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it's not about me anymore, but who? Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am identified with Christ. You can hold my past over my head, but I don't know that person anymore. I'm now identified with Christ. I'm identified with him. I'm identified with grace. I'm identified with forgiveness. And by the way, because I'm identified with forgiveness, I now have to learn to forgive other people. Because I needed grace, I've got to give it to others. My redemption is not about me. It's not about bettering my current situation. It's about picking up my cross so I can be identified with him. I want to look more like him. He's got to chisel away at those things. James 3 says... To talk, you know, talks about the tongue and how we should control what we say about others. Why? Because everyone is made in the image and likeness of God. And so we are created in his image according to the book of Genesis. And that means that even though we're born into this depraved world, something inside of us is worth redeeming because he created you. You are a part of his family. You were created in his image. He's not calling you to be a spiritual robot, but he's calling you to, to change. We're not perfect. After, you have, after you're born again, that doesn't mean you're never going to fail or mess up. You're still going to need grace. You're still going to need mercy. You're still going to need the Savior to walk with you through some things. But it means that I don't go back and pick up the old things again. He's calling us to humility but not to shame. You don't have to carry around shame the rest of your life. It just... If we're prideful, sometimes it's because we're scared of humility. We're scared of saying we're wrong because we feel like we're going to have to carry shame around. You can actually be forgiven, admit you were wrong, and not pick up the shame and carry it with you. You don't have to carry shame with you. A call to change isn't the same as condemnation. You don't have to live in shame unless you are living in pride. I don't know if you've met someone that's prideful. If you've met me, you have met someone that's prideful. But those who live in pride, they, they, they can't ever admit they're wrong. So they, they just try to defend a life full of bad choices because they can't ever just admit they're wrong. And so they have to carry shame. But Michelangelo, again, he didn't pass up on the stone that the other two artists passed up. Why not? Because the stone wasn't the problem. The stone wasn't the issue. I know the other two artists, they gave up on the stone. But... Michelangelo saw that the stone wasn't the problem. And our humanity is not the problem. God's not calling you to live by a bunch of rules so that you can be perfect. That's not going to happen. He's calling real human beings with real flaws, but those who are at least willing to change. And this is the beauty of this whole process. This is what made Michelangelo great. This is what made him such a great artist. He said this about his statues. He said, I saw the angel in the marble. I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. When they saw a stone that was blank, I saw what was inside of that. I, I saw what could, be, what could come out of that. It was already there. It wasn't that I was going to take and make something. It was already there. I was going to take something out of that and bring it into the light and make it something beautiful where people thousands of years later would walk by and say, wow. Because he saw the angel in the stone. He saw something that nobody else could see already. God sees past the stone. He sees beyond the stone. And he sees who you're truly meant to be if you'll sur surrender your will. Where everybody else sees imperfections, he says, I already see what that can become. You may have discarded that, but I already see what's inside of that. I already see what I can make with that. I already see what I can mold with that. 
I already see what's there. That's what makes a great artist. He is the ultimate artist. Because he looks at me with all my flaws and all my failures and he says, I see what's inside of there. I see what can come out of that. If he'll just surrender himself to me, if he'll surrender his will to me, then I can begin to shape and mold and take what's already there and make something great and beautiful out of it. But it takes us throwing up our hands and saying, God, I surrender. I surrender. That's all he's asking. He's not going to discard you like everybody else. I promise. He's going to reshape you. He's not going to rob you of your personality and your giftings. He wants to use those things for his kingdom. But it starts with surrender. It starts with surrender. I have a cousin. He, he passed away a few years ago. and We were about the same age. And when he was seven or eight years old, he got baptized. Because we all, you know, preacher's kids, we, we were getting baptized at seven, eight years old, baby. We're not waiting because we don't want to miss the rapture. We're already on it. But he was, he was given, a, a pastor sat down with him and said, hey, you're going to be baptized and we're going to wash away your sins. And God's going to forgive you of all your sins. And he looked at that pastor and he said, with all sincerity, I, I like my sins. <laughs> I don't want my sins to go. It's the honesty of a child, right? I think that's one of the beauties of, of, of children in their relationship with God is sometimes we're not honest as adults. We do like our sins. We, say, we, don't, we have a hard time saying, oh, I, but I, I like my sin. I don't want to change. But that's what makes the gospel so difficult for us because Jesus didn't come to make us more rich. He didn't come to make us famous. He didn't come to protect us from all harm, contrary to what you may have been told. He came to redeem us from sin. He came to change us. And take us out of sin. That's what he came for. And that process isn't glamorous. It's not beautiful. It doesn't make you wealthy. It doesn't make you... And I, and I don't believe God's against any of that. I'm just saying that it's not about any of that. We get caught up in all those things. But really God's whole plan for our life is to change us so we can change others. It really comes down to that. He wants to change you so that you can change other people. And so we can all go to heaven together. That's it. That's our plan here. That's our purpose here. And so he starts to chisel away at pride, and we complain that it hurts, and we grumble about it, we complain, but we give up on the process because it isn't happening in our time frame, and we give up before we see the finished product. I want to see the finished product. I don't know about you, but I want to see the finished pro I want to see what God's doing. I want to see what he's up to, what he can make out of us. So I think of Michelangelo. In the middle of the night, he's sweating, he's dripping with sweat. His arms are exhausted. His fingers are probably bruised from the hammer. And he's just chipping away and he's chipping away. And he keeps going. It's painful, but he keeps going. The cross was painful, but he just kept, kept walking, kept facing every part of it. And, and, and Christ himself would even cry out, God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is painful. This is endurance. It's not easy, but he endured the cross. Why? Because he was working on a masterpiece. And now it's our turn to carry the cross. And we find it to be heavy. And it goes against everything in us to be selfless, to serve others is difficult, to forgive people who have wounded us and turn the other cheek is difficult. It's near to impossible to apologize when we've been disappointed and we feel like people have let us down. And sometimes apologizing itself feels degrading and just admitting we're wrong feels excruciating. And getting past and repairing the things we have broken is a long process. And so we're chipping away at all this pride. And it's a process that doesn't always happen overnight. But as he begins to chip away at our heart of stone, he's building this masterpiece that's beautiful. It looks nothing like the rest of the world because the rest of the world holds on to her hurts and disappointments and bitterness. The rest of the world looks bitter, but when God gets done with you, you don't have bitterness anymore. No, you're not perfect, but you don't carry bitterness. You don't carry a heart of stone. You don't carry anger. You don't carry all that with you anymore because he's worked on you. And then there's Paul. Paul is a man who persecuted Christians, a man who stood and watched as Stephen, an apostle, was martyred. Paul was converted only to be met with scorn, rejection, and persecution. He traded his pride. Paul was a well-accomplished man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was well-read. He was well-spoken. He had accomplished great things. But he traded all that. He traded his pride for a cross. It wasn't a win by the world's standards. But Paul, in Romans 5, proclaims boldly, 
Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in what? Our sufferings. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance. He says, I, re- I, re- I rejoice in this process because I know what the master is up to. And endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were just a blank stone, a blank canvas, not anything to be hung in a museum, not anything to be looked at, not anything worth anything, but someone who had been given up on by two other artists because of the imperfections. He sees that and he dies for us while we were yet sinners. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, Now that you are a finished product, now that you are that art piece, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What lies beyond the stone is our redemption. It's the finished product. I know it's painful to go through things. I know it's painful to forgive. I know it's difficult. But when you get to the other side of that and you're that finished product, God is going to use you to make an impact on the world like you never thought was possible. I truly believe that. Jesus took on our burdens and he nailed them to a cross. He endured mockery, beating. He was spat on. He was nailed to a tree. But guess what? Three days later, beyond a stone, behind a stone, life began to breathe into his body. The masterpiece was finished beyond the stone. And the stone was rolled away. And my Jesus walked out of an empty tomb with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And there's nothing now that I don't have access to. There's not one of his promises that you can't have access to. There's not one thing that you can't do through Christ if you trust in him today. Would you stand with me? Can we just give him praise for that? Can we just give him praise for rising again three days later, taking on my sin, taking on my shame, being my healer and my redeemer, even when I didn't deserve it, he has finished the masterpiece. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes, he endured the cross, but it was all setting up for an empty tomb. It's not just about the pain. It's not just about the carving. It's not just about the painful experience of allowing him to shape us and mold us. It's about what's on the other side of that. He's bringing you somewhere. He's taking you somewhere. And my hope for you today is that you will trade in a heart of stone. Let go of some of the things that have been difficult to let go of. Forgive somebody. Let go of the thing that's gotten in your way. Let him begin to sculpt you and mold you again. Say, God, I want you to finish the product that you started. I don't want to fight against what you're up to. I don't need to rebel against what you're up to. This is not about me. It's not about pride. It's not about my vanity. It's not about my selfishness. I just want to know what you're going to finish. I want to see the finished product. I want to see the end of my story. I want to see what you can do with my life if I will trust you. I want to see what you can make happen with, with me if I'll just give up, if I'll just surrender. We're so prone to fighting. We want to fight for everything. We want to fight for our own pride. We want to fight and we wrestle against God at times because we don't want to give up. And God is saying, just quit, just quit. I've got this. But you got to put it in my hands. you got to trust in me. I can do the work. I can finish the art piece. I know everybody else seen imperfections in you and, and now you're, you're hurt and you're bitter and you want to hold on to that heart of stone because it, it's comfortable. It's where you're comfortable. But if you just let me have that, I can do a work in you. If you just let me have that heart of stone, I can put a heart of flesh there. I can make a testimony out of it. I can make a story out of it. But I need you to give it over to me. I need you to surrender to me. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship together. And I know that there's no perfect people in this room. So please feel comfortable as we're praying together. 
to just begin to speak to God about everything that's going on in your life, whatever it may be. It may seem small, it may seem trivial, but nothing's too trivial for him and nothing's too great for him. Now we're going to allow God to just work on our hearts for a moment. Can we do that together? Can we allow God to just work on our hearts? And there may be something in your past that's been years ago since you've thought about it. Maybe you put it in a safe box where you didn't want to think about it anymore because it's safe there. But I'm just asking for a moment. Can we be vulnerable with God? Sometimes we're so prideful we don't want to be vulnerable. But can we just be vulnerable with God and say, God, okay, I trust you with this. I, I, don't, want to, I, I, I don't want to try to protect this or pretend like I'm perfect. I just want to be vulnerable with you for a moment. And so I'm going to open up my heart to you to do a work. Can we do that together? Father, I thank you for this day. You've been so good to us, God. We thank you for the cross. It's where we find who we are. It's where we find ourselves again. But God, I know you want to do a work in this room. I know, God, that there is someone in this room who's been hurt in the past, who's been wounded. I know, God, that there's someone in this room who doesn't have a perfect past, who has made mistakes, and somewhere along the way was told they were not good enough because of the imperfections. But God, we dispel any of those lies today. You are a God of truth. You're a God that is just. You're a God that is perfect. And you said, you said that we're redeemed. It doesn't matter what anyone else said. It doesn't matter what anyone else thought. Because if you said it, you're faithful to fulfill it. And so today, God, today we make the choice God, to lay down some things. To lay down some things at the cross. To lay down some burdens. To lay down some old habits, some old hurts, some old hang-ups. And to allow you, God, to begin a work that is fresh in us, that is new in us. To complete the work you've already started. And I believe that there's redemption in this room. I believe that your spirit's in this room. I believe, God, that you have all power and all authority to make us and shape us into your image. And so, God, we just give you everything. We surrender everything and we choose you today, God. Begin to make me new, God. Begin to wash me clean. Begin to make me fresh in your image. I want to look like you, God. I want to look like you. I want you to begin to shape me today. Make me a better person, God. Make me someone who looks more like you. Forgive me for the past. Help me to forgive others who have wronged me. Help me to forgive those who have hurt me in the past, God. Help us, God, to, to, to practice forgiveness daily so we can look more like you. And I pray that you would chip away at our pride this morning. I pray that, that pride wouldn't have a place here in this room, that we could be vulnerable with you for just a moment. And God, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do, God. You're so holy. You're worthy of all praise, all honor, and all glory. We thank you in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to worship together for a moment. If you feel comfortable coming forward and worshiping with us, please do. Please do. And we're just going to worship him and just give God everything. Can we just surrender? The part of worship is just surrender this morning. So we're just going to surrender together. Can we do that together?